Hey, Beth, you can just give me a thumbs up that you can see my slides there. Okay, all good. So, um, so thank you very much to Minitex and, and Elizabeth for inviting me to come and speak to you all today. One of the things that I have to say in my sort of new role as a PhD student, one of the things that I have always relished was the teaching part um, of what I've always done. I have been a high school teacher and have done a little bit of teaching at the college level and most recently was doing work with um, teachers and librarians. And this is really one of the things that I love to do. I love to talk to people about um, these issues about you know, really sort of making sense of our media landscape that we're looking at today and, and issues about um, news literacy. And librarians have always been a group of people that um, have been always close to my heart. And you'll see why. <laughs> so um, I'm really excited to be here and talking with you. So um, what I'm gonna be doing today is we're gonna talk a little bit about our current media landscape. And what I'm also gonna do is take you through a lesson from the Center for News Literacy, which is a place where I used to work and who and where we developed a set of curriculum that I still use and I'm using as part of my studies now that can help us to frame some ideas and use some tools for drawing distinctions around different media types, which is one thing that we'll want to be thinking about as we go through um, this talk on understanding our uh, particular media landscape. So first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some quick background on me just to contextualize um, this subject and also my own connection to libraries. And if I hit the right button. Um, so first, um, I want to tell you that my professional career has always been set in education. And the first place that I started was here. And it was now some, I guess, almost 17, 17 years ago that I started as an elementary school librarian. Or when I first was introduced to it, I was told, you'll be the media specialist. <laughs> so admittedly, it was the media part of that description that got me to apply for the job. Um, but then what I sort of learned was it was working with these young people, grades K through six at the school that I was at, that really got me interested in teaching. So after that, I spent seven years in the Washington DC public schools, um, where I was a media studies and media production teacher and also worked in uh, public charter schools in DC. And in those classes, um, I started utilizing some lessons that were part of the Center for News Literacy, which is at Stony Brook University, their college level class to teach issues around media studies, to teach um, some of the things that we were talking about today. And then later, I joined the center as a team member to help them uh, develop further curriculum tools and also their digital resource center for easy distribution of those tools. Because one of the goals we had was to not only create curriculum, but also make it easy to access for educators of all stripes. And I would include librarians in that group too. And then that work later brought me to the Chicago area, which is where I am now. Um, where, uh, funny enough, a comment that I posted on a story about the use of media literacy in libraries led to a connection with the programming office of the American Library Association. So that was about, I think about three, three or four years ago now, and where we developed the first prototype project that became media literacy at your library. And in that project, I provided training in news literacy to librarians in service of developing tools and workshops that they could then use in their own libraries for use with their adult populations. And then that work then later iterated into another project um, that produced this practitioner's guide, Media Literacy in the Library. And there's a link, there's a short link there that can take you to that guide. Um, to let you know about that, and, and it'll probably be coming up in the chat too. Thank you. Um, where this guide uh, really looks to continually provide resources and frameworks for library staff to work with patrons on these issues around navigating, you know, the huge explosion of information online. 
So as a developer on this project, I emphasized a need to focus on specific concepts that are part of media literacy. Because one thing we have to keep in mind is that we can say media, well, what media literacy is, it's a collection of a number of skills and sets of knowledge and so on that we will con that we want to encourage patrons and encourage students to use regularly, not to just see this as a one and done sort of thing. I've just been having some conversations with folks here in Illinois um, with um, in relation to a piece of legislation that, you're, that they're looking at. I think our state Senate is getting ready to put a requirement for a a media literacy unit into the required courses. And I've been doing some interviews and people have been asking me about what is media literacy? And one of the things I emphasize is that it's a lot of different things. Um, and it's not just one particular set of skills that we need to have. Um, so again, I sort of emphasize starting small with these with uh, main concepts. And that's what we'll look at today, bite-sized chunks that uh, patrons can use and work with in lots of ways. So what we highlighted in the in the guide were some key topics in media literacy, um, which included things like architecture of the internet, media landscape, which is actually where a lot of this um, uh, presentation was derived from, um, among others. And we're going to use some lessons in news media literacy to do so. So where I'm going to start at today is where um, the Center for News Literacy's classes start with the challenges that face today's information consumer. The other thing I'm gonna mention too, as we get started is, as an educator, I'm gonna implement some um, interaction in today's presentation. So I'm gonna encourage you, if you have another device, if you got a tablet, if you got a cell phone, or even if you're on a computer, to open up another uh, tab on your browser, or open up your browser window, and I'm gonna give you a link um, later as we go along to answer some questions so we can do some back and forth here along with definitely inviting you to put questions um, in the chat. So as we get started, um, so what we're going to start here is where they, where all of our classes are with the challenges. So, um, so first, we have four big challenges. First is speed versus accuracy. And what that goes into is really understanding that in order for us to get things correct, it takes time for us to do so. Just as all of us know, it takes time for us to do research and to um, read all the things we need over time to really understand a particular subject. Shoot, I have to admit, I've been working at this for the past 10 years and there's still only a, a little bit that I actually know um, on this. But that can also uh, run into one of the things that's been characteristic of our online information ecosystem where information comes at us so quickly that it can be hard for us to just slow things down and say, wait a minute, if I'm getting something right now in the moment, is this correct? Is it accurate? So those two things sort of run into each other lots of times um, in today's sort of media ecosystem. Second is just that there's way too much information. And sometimes what that can lead us to as consumers is to shut down instead of be more mindful about our consumption of media. So we just have so much around us that it can become really, really difficult for us to put in place knowledge structures, ways of thinking when coming towards information. The third, which is also related to this, is that lots of this information is disintermediated. And what that means, and I'll go into more of a, a detailed uh, definition of this later, but what this means is that information now or messages can be sent directly from the creator, directly to the consumer without some sort of human mediator in the middle or intermediator that can help us to say, this is relevant for the audience, this has been vetted or so on. What this has led to is a, also a blurring of the lines between categories of different media types. So sometimes it can be difficult if we're looking at something like YouTube to know if we're looking at news or if we're looking at something that's entertainment or so on. And the last challenge is just overcoming our own, sometimes I'm a little uh, hesitant to use the term bias, but one of the other ways I'll describe this too is that when we come to new information, we bring all of our quote unquote baggage with us. We bring our previous experiences, what we've learned over time, our own dispositions, our identities toward that information. 
And sometimes that can shape the way that we interpret different pieces of information in different ways. So sometimes it becomes even more important for us to get the training to take ourselves out of that process of, of interpretation. Yes, um, that's a big part of how we interpret information, but we also have to know that sometimes it, we have to kind of step back from that. But the one we're gonna focus on the most today is this blurring of the lines about making distinctions between different genres of media. So here's a prime example of this issue of blurring of the lines. It's highlighted in these two Facebook posts. So they look very much the same, but they have very different purposes. And if we were in person, I probably would you know, stop here and say, okay, take a minute, turn to your partner and talk a little bit about what looks the same on these two posts and what looks different. As you're taking a look at them, you'll see one is uh, comes from NPR and the other comes from this home chef and you'll see that it says sponsored under it. So you'll see that although they look very much the same, uh, one has the intention to inform from NPR and then one has the intent to sell something. So we have an advertisement. But as we know, when we're going through social media, lots of times we just scroll, 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 and we're kind of glancing at information. And I'll talk a little bit about um, that as well later on in our presentation today. So in our main objectives that we want to take a look at um, in the lesson that we're going to hear about, we want to, one, differentiate between media genres. Because one of the things that I wrote about in the practitioner's guide that I showed you earlier was that we sort of take on different ways of thinking when we come towards different types of information or different genres of media. So think about when you sit down to watch a movie on Netflix, you're not trying to do all of the same mental gymnastics that you might do when reading a research paper, right? So it becomes important for us to be able to know what it is I'm looking at and how I should think about it. Secondly, we wanna identify when lines blur between these genres. And then we wanna apply strategies for determining credible and reliable sources of information. And one of the other things I wanna to emphasize too with this is that my goal is to provide you with tools and strategies for doing so on your own, instead of me telling you where you should go. The question I get a lot of times when I give these presentations is, well, where do you get your news? And I tell people, well, I can, I could certainly tell you that, but that doesn't mean that now all of a sudden, these are the only places you should go. The last thing that any media literacy or news literacy or associated um, literacy class should do is try to indoctrinate people to think a certain way. What we wanna do is we wanna encourage people to just be more mindful and make decisions on their own. All right, so we're coming to our first question. So get ready with that um, with your uh, browser window. So as we know, we've witnessed some huge shifts in the ways that we find, consume and share information. And the variety of sources that we're, continue, we're confronted with continue on an almost daily basis to expand. So what are some of the sources you use regularly? So we're gonna do a quick poll. We're gonna take just about 60 seconds. So to answer the poll, you're gonna to go to, if you're on a, um, a, well, if you're using a browser, you can go to menti, M-E-N-T-I.com. And when you get there, you're gonna be asked to enter a code. Use the code 42769645. It's in the chat and it's also here on the screen use that code to answer. You can answer up to three times. Tell us what are some of your primary sources of information. I'm going to leave this slide up for a few seconds and then I'll put the uh, results up as we go. And I'll start this music to give us our one minute.
So we see some, we've got lots of different sources here. So we've got NPR, we've got New York Times, we've got Facebook, we've got Twitter, we've got newspapers, podcasts, friends and family, uh, local news outlets, Minnesota Public Radio, and so on. So you'll see that there's lots of places where we can get information. And there are probably different ways that we think about each of those different sources. Um, so for instance, we come to NPR maybe to get news and we see it as a trusted source. We may also um, sometimes go to Facebook to get certain kinds of information that might be a primary source uh, of information for us there. All right, I'm gonna switch back over to my slide. Okay, so as we know, like we were just talking about, the landscape of media has expanded, certainly, due to the internet. But it's also contracted a bit due to that. And what this image here represents is the wide scale of, of platforms that meet certain communication needs online. And if you look at the outside of that, um, that circle there, it highlights some of the communication needs that we might have which include networking, collaborating, sharing, and so on. So in terms of collaborating, we might use something like Google Docs in order to work on a document together. We might share pictures on an outlet like Instagram. Um, and as you uh, see there in the middle, Google, Facebook, and Twitter somewhat overlap. They, they meet lots of these different communication needs. But also consider this, these are not only outlets for media, there are also places where people are creating information. So now we are not only consumers of media, we are also creators of media. So if you post that picture on, on Instagram or you put that video up on YouTube, you now are a media creator. And there are responsibilities that go with that. But the platforms themselves are not gonna tell you what exactly those are. They are gonna encourage you to put more information up there. So in terms of amateur creators now, the marketplace or outlets have exploded, offering everyone a bit of space for gaining the attention of the consumer. Now, on the other hand, this has formed a problem for professional media creators or people who work within the media industry. These are producers, directors, actors, and so on. And we've seen this through a few trends within the industry. The largest is the ongoing consolidation of media companies into larger conglomerates in order to maintain their market placement and means for generating profits. So as an example, as you'll see in this chart here, around 1983, more than 80% of US-based media was created and controlled by 50 different companies. But today, as you see this line uh, represents, that story is much different. Now, in today's society, now we come to it, only about five companies own that same, what, what is now 90% of American mass media. And these are highlighted and display and shows the landscape of these companies that, uh, that make up these top five. They include, at the moment, AT&T, Comcast, Disney, Viacom, CBS, and Fox. And you'll see here that other companies have merged together to create the market caps that each of these companies own. Now, so now one of the other trends that's somewhat concerning is that some of these largest players not only control media production, but also the distribution of that content. As we see with Comcast ownership of NBC and Universal Studios, and also the means for distributing that content. And there's also the, um, the example with AT&T owning Warner Media. But one of the things to also keep in mind is that this is starting to change. We're just in the last few weeks, AT&T has announced that they're going to spin off their media creation uh, uh, parts of Warner Media and sell and merge them in with Discovery Media to create an even larger conglomerate of media creation. Now this may be saying that for media um, distributors that it's difficult to be in the media creation business. Because one of the things that we wanna keep in mind and wanna watch out for is that if media production companies become more loyal to its sponsors than its audience, then we may begin to have 
issues with what gets created. We may see more and more of the same type of maybe content that comes out. This trend of consolidation is also happening within the news business where larger organizations, sometimes hedge funds is what has happened with um, the Chicago Tribune uh, and their uh, network of uh, news outlets or newspapers, they buy up local newspapers and change their business models, their mission sometimes, and even sometimes insert themselves into the type of content that they produce. And what this does is it leaves some areas of the country with very little local news coverage via newspapers or other print outlets. So this is shown in this chart from the Columbia Journalism Review, which is using some of the research being done by, um, I can't remember the researcher's name, but I know she's out of the University of North Carolina, where we start to grow into what, what is called here these news deserts, where we have less and less local coverage of local issues. And as this happens, we get this gap in the information that people have available to them in these areas. And then other information purveyors will take advantage of that gap and try and fill it with information that may mimic news outlets, but has different intents and purposes other than informing the reader. This was highlighted in a New York Times uh, story um, about a single nationwide organization operating what they called newspapers and websites that were full of favorable information for a particular political party or a company. And this can also happen online where we might see websites be created that again, mimic news outlets, but in, in essence are made to promote a particular candidate or a particular party. Now, this is where we start to get into issues about the differentiated media landscape, where there are few rules that can govern how consumers should know how to differentiate between the different purposes of different media products. Now, in traditional broadcast media, we have certain markers that help us as a consumer to know where we're watching. We may see programs run on a schedule, so we'll know that well, we live in the central time zone, so maybe around five o'clock the news comes on. If it's 7 p.m., we know that primetime entertainment programs usually come on. Another marker is that consumers can use differentiated channels that might help to denote different kinds of programming, such as CNN having news and informational programming, HGTV having programming that has to do with issues around the home. Some of these structures are also available online. Streaming platforms like Hulu and Netflix might provide multiple markers such as genre markers to let viewers know and make choices about the types of programs they wanna get. But now in our online uh, media ecosystem, we'll take a closer look at this idea of disintermediation. And what this is defined as is a system of media creation and sharing that's largely characterized by direct content between creators and consumers, where again, human mediators are taken out of the middle. So the middleman is taken out and they are, and the consumer is left to make the decision on whether or not the media that they're seeing is, is, is of quality or relevant for their needs. Sometimes this middleman, now this can create some good things because now we might hear and get media from people who may not have traditionally had access to these outlets of information or outlets for uh, distributing information. But also at the same time, it also opens up the floodgates to those that might have different purposes. Now, why might we have these intermediaries? How do they work? Let's look at this in a newsroom. So using uh, news media as a prime example, some of the roles in the newsroom might include an editor, or a news director in the case of a broadcast news program. And those people help to make decisions on whether or not a piece of content or a story makes it to the front page of your newspaper's website or their front page of the paper or to the screens of audiences. In the example here in NPR's newsroom, a story might first start with a reporter here. And it gets pitched uh, that idea gets pitched to an assistant or an associate producer who may be 
here. And they give them ideas for the story and will help to, uh, to craft it and give them approval to begin with that story. Then once the reporter gets all the elements, they do their interviews and so on, they may work with another producer to shape it and an engineer to get it recorded and the actualities put together. So that person may be there. And that person, again, gives them feedback on how the story is coming across, what things they may have missed and so on. Then that story will go to a senior editor for placement within the broadcast. And that may be a senior producer for, uh, so I know that a, a number of people put in NPR, so that might be for All Things Considered or Morning Edition or another program it might go into. Again and again, we might get input on how to create, continue to shape that story. Then they may give that story back to the reporter and say, okay, make these small changes and it'll be ready to be broadcast. So in this particular example, we see how multiple hands can touch a story, but sometimes we may only see that one or two names are on the byline of that story. But what this does is it helps to ensure that the stories are free of errors and are accurate as possible. Now, on the other hand, online, on social media platforms, they largely allow users to freely post content and share it with others with, again, very little human-mediated oversight. And again, I want to emphasize the human part of this because, yes, there are, um, uh, they are called algorithms um, that might do some of that oversight, but they can't do the same sort of reasoning that humans can do. And much of this is due to the overwhelming amount of information shared on it. Just keep, just take in mind that now it's estimated that on YouTube, over a hundred hours of video are uploaded to it every minute of every day. So how easy is it gonna be to go through all of that content? It would take three years just to go through all of that information. Then that would be posted to uh, YouTube in a day. So for some stats, I gave you that. <laughs> um, so disintermediated platforms have certainly offered benefits like I talked about, but, um, but, and they allow us to sort of find information is very specific interests and they've allowed people to crowdsource information and knowledge. But on the flip side, platforms like YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, they've also been hotbeds for missing disinformation. And what they do is they flatten the markers that allow us to know what exactly we're looking at. So they make different pieces of content, whether they be from a news outlet or uh, uh, just a user, look the same. So what can we do about this? Now, one of the ways is, become, is to become more mindful about your media consumption. We probably heard about some ways to do this. We could use fact checks, such as like those from PolitiFact. We can use checklists that tell us what to look for and things to do when we come upon new information or fake news, which is actually a term that I really avoid using many times because the meaning can mean so many different things based on who you get it from. Or we can use a tool like NewsGuard that can tell us whether or not or how good a particular outlet is or how biased it may be. And while it's true that all of these things can be helpful, but engaging online with content is like sometimes I've heard drinking from a fire hose. And in reality, the minute you master one of these various tools, you'll probably run into an exception to those rules. So it makes it all the more important for the user to pick up skills that you can, you can continually use over and over and over again to discern credibility on your own. This is also highlighted in what, what I talked about as mindful consumption or change in mindset and greater awareness of the effects of media. And this does take some work and it takes training. Um, a recent study in the journal Nature from a group of scientists led by Gordon Prinnicook, who's a professor of behavioral science and expert on decision-making sciences, uh, recently reported that by shifting people's attention towards sharing accurate information online, that the researchers could encourage better sharing behaviors. This, the authors argue, is because social media is frequently driven by other factors to share information instead of making sure that information is accurate. Some of these can include aligning with existing political beliefs, humor, or simply outrage. 
And this is one of many studies that discuss the need for changing mindsets in relation to tackling misinformation online. So I would definitely encourage, I'm glad some people picked up on not using the term fake news because it could almost trigger some people to think a certain way. Um, so it's important for us to pick up new tools and to engage with media actively. So one of those tools that I use is through news media literacy. So these are, so what news media literacy is, sometimes shortened to news literacy, it entails a strategic collection of concepts that can be used to develop skills for more mindful and active media consumption. It uses journalism as a platform for development of those skill sets, and it uses news media as a, as a platform for practicing those skills. So two of the most prominent providers are the Center for News Literacy and the News Literacy Project two organizations that you may already be aware of. So being that, I want to emphasize again, I probably have said this for the third time, so excuse me for repeating myself again, that there is no one lesson or tool that you can quickly learn and then all of a sudden be, I'm media literate, I'm news literate. It takes time and practice to do so. So now that being said, I would say it's definitely possible. Okay, so it's definitely a spectrum. It's not no uh, on and off sort of thing. So what we're going to do is going to look at one particular lesson that um, can be that I hope and, and can provide you with some resources for that you can use with some of your patrons or students if you're at a university. That is of the information neighborhoods that comes from the Center for News Literacy. Uh, this is also used in News Literacy Projects curriculum. They call these info zones. So what this is, um, I'm showing to you here, the Center for News Literacy has developed a taxonomy of information neighborhoods that highlights six different media genres. They include journalism, entertainment, advertising, publicity, propaganda, and raw information. Now, I will admit that propaganda is somewhat of a loaded term, so I might almost call that more information that persuades uh, with the intention to persuade. But what we try to focus on here, and while the taxonomy shows you the goals, the methods, the practitioners, and the outcome, we like to focus on, when I'm giving these presentations, focus on two elements, those of the goals and the outcomes. What are the goals of this piece of media and what are the intended outcomes? As you can see in each, there are specific goals highlighted with an intended outcome. It's helpful to think of these as guides to help you understand the intent of each genre. Now, some of these are easy to identify. So when you watch a clip from Saturday Night Live, you know you're there to be entertained. But um, for a commercial for bounty paper tiles, you know that the intent is to sell you on a brand. But sometimes it can become more blurry. These genres can get blurred. So here's an example that we'll take a look at. This comes from a YouTuber, Brian Tyler Cohen. And this is from the banner at the top of his page. So he identifies himself as breaking news every day, no BS. Okay, so you would think, okay, well, he sounds like a journalist, right? So we're going to take a look at a clip from one of his YouTube videos. And when I'm going to, and I'm going to, again, bring up a, a Mentimeter slide to have you answer which one of these genres of media you think it might fit into. Let's take a look at the video and then we'll get to the Mentimeter. Oh, because it's just let me go back real quick and mention to you the clip starts with a Fox News segment and then Cohen comes after it. So think about these two things working together. So the Fox News segment and then uh, Cohen's piece comes afterwards. Yes, because it's just happened now and I want to double check this with our producers. Um, the DHS secretary Alejandro Mayorkas has resigned, Mr. President. Well, I'm not surprised. Good. That's a big victory for our country. Hold, hold on. Let me let let me stop. Let me stop. Let me listen to my team one more time. Forgive me. That has not happened. But uh, well, and I apologize. Okay. Listening to the team and okay. you. Cross off but that victory. I know that you. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is Fox News's Harris Faulkner just outright lying on air to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of viewers and claiming the Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas has resigned before having to walk that back and say that, in fact, he hasn't resigned. But sure, this is a very, very serious news network. 
All right. So this is just a piece of uh, of Cohen's uh, sort of work. So now we're going to try to identify which of these genres you think this belongs to. So we're going to go back to minty.com again. You're going to use the same code as before. Uh, you might need to refresh. I just had to move the, the slide. But you can respond by telling us which one of these information neighborhoods does this clip belong. Um, I'm going to play it again for you to give you the time to answer. Yes, because it's just happened now, and I want to double check this with our producers. Um, the DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas has resigned, Mr. President. Your well, first... I'm not surprised. Good. That's a big victory for our country. Hold, hold on. Let me let let me stop. Let me stop. Let me listen to my team one more time. Forgive me. That has not happened, but. Uh, well, and I apologize, okay. listening to the team okay. and you. Cross off but that I know that you. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is Fox News' Harris Faulkner just outright lying on air to hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of viewers and claiming the Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas has resigned before having to walk that back and say that, in fact, he hasn't resigned. But sure, this is a very, very serious news network. All right. And yes, as was mentioned here, Mary, that the uh, clip was edited. I did that editing there just to, it was basically a pause in the middle um, just to sort of speed this up some. So uh, so that was me, not him. But um, as we see here, a lot of people are answering entertainment. Some are saying publicity. Some are saying raw information. Some are saying journalism, all right? So when we look at a clip like this one, we it can be sort of difficult for us to know whether or not he's given us news because there's some topical information that's being uh, conveyed here. And then Cohen comes in and sort of commentates on it, which we probably see a lot of. A lot of people do um, reaction videos or are giving us commentary on a certain um, piece of uh, current information. So going back here, what we might want to think about is, and one of the problems here, is that Cohen mentions breaking news on his channel page. But in this particular example, which contains mostly opinions about the other outlet, and if we take a look at the description of the video, it also advocates for a particular point of view on the previous president, where he says, makes a huge mistake. And then if you take a look at the sort of bottom of uh, that description, it says the, to demand the arrest of Donald Trump's sign here, right? So it might not, so we might not think of this as journalism whose intent is to just inform, but whether to sort of entertain, but probably also to promote uh, Cohen as well. So I'd be hard pressed to call this journalism taking a look um, a little bit uh, behind the curtain, Cohen is actually an actor who it appears to be building a brand on something known as infotainment, where entertainment and current events sort of run into one another. Think of programs like Last Week Tonight on HBO or the monologues that run at the beginning of late night talk shows. In these cases, the major intent is to entertain instead of inform. But with that being said, I'll also mention that it can be important for it. There's not a problem with looking at pro with programs like that. I mean, I watch programs like that myself, but it can be helpful for us to be to ground our knowledge base in the news itself before we go to the places that might want to tell us, OK, here's how you might want to think about it. There was a question that came up in the chat about um, commentary and opinion as part of journalism. So there is such a thing as opinion journalism, and you'll see there are some characteristics that we want to look for in that um, that does align with journalism itself that we'll talk a little bit about and I'll mention. So there is such a thing as opinion journalism that can help us to make sense out of the news. But then on the opposite end of that, there's just sheer uh, assertion where we don't have proof that goes along with that opinion or the evidence that helps to form that opinion. So what we have here 
is a definition of news. In a news literacy, in a news literacy class, this is how we define news. It's information of some public interest that's shared and subject to a journalistic process of verification for which an independent individual or organization is directly accountable. So in this taxonomy is practitioners, reporters, photographers, editors, and so on, should follow these three things as part of their practice. So let's look at each of these. Verification is the process that establishes or confirms truth or accuracy. So how should consumers look for this? First, we start by telling our students, identify what claim is being made in a story, and then ask yourself what evidence is used to support that claim. So here's an example that comes from a story from the New York Times from the end of last summer about a doctor who had, um, had developed somewhat of a habit of supplying disputed data on COVID cases. Um, just to sort of, uh, I'm gonna have to move a little bit quicker through this than I thought, but uh, the doctor here, uh, Dr. Desai, was a scientist who collected data for a study used to support the belief that anti-malarial drugs were dangerous to patients when used as a treatment for the coronavirus. The study was later retracted. The claim then being made in the story was that Dr. Desai, who supplied the data, is said to have a history of cutting corners and misrepresenting information in pursuit of his ambitions. That's a pretty big claim. Now we ask, how do you know that? So we look further down in the story and we'll see some examples. We'll see that the reporters say they, in the second uh, paragraph here, interviews with more than a dozen doctors who saw some of the things that this doctor did. So again, we will want to look for evidence that helps to support the claims that are made in the story. And we want to look for multiple pieces of evidence, not just one or cherry picked pieces of evidence. Now, secondly, there's independence. And what independence is, it's freedom from the control or influence of interested parties, coupled with a system of checks and balances to avoid the influencing of pre-existing beliefs on coverage. So something I mentioned earlier, this on a publication level means that a publication has freedom from the control or influence of any interested parties, especially on the outcome of the story or the framing of it. What this helps is to provide a sense of relative objectivity during the process of reporting. Because while reporters are humans and they will have points of view, those points of view shouldn't be reflected in a news story. And that again, can be helped by having multiple people take a look at that news story that will have different points of view. Those journalists should also act with a sense of independence with the intended outcome of informing the audience. So in an example here, we see a, a, a local lawmaker or a local mayor admitting for using a false identity to write news stories for one of the local news outlets. This would be a lack of independence. And I'm gonna skip past this one. Lastly is accountability. Accountability refers to the publisher taking responsibility for the information being shared through their publication. So how can we look for this as consumers? The way we can find accountability or look for accountability by outlets is with things like a byline. Do we know who wrote this story? Also, could we reach out to these uh, reporters who worked on this story? We could go and roll over each of these names and see um, how we could contact them. Maybe there's an email address, maybe there's a Twitter account that we can reach out to. There can also be a date line that tells us when the story was published or when it was edited. Also, outlets may publish corrections that will highlight if a wrong piece of information was included in a story and tell us what they did to correct that information and not just doing so blindly, even if these are small things such as uh, misspelling a name. So these among other things can help news consumers make decisions on the credibility and reliability of the outlets publishing the information. So the big lesson here, and I know I moved through it kind of fast, is that we wanna make sure when encountering something that calls itself news is that the information that it publishes is verified, that the outlet 
has structures in place to ensure a relative level of independence and that it is accountable for the information that it publishes. So we wanna make sure we have all three of those things in a piece of news. And going back to that question about journalistic opinion, while uh, journalistic opinion can definitely show and have a particular point of view, it should also have these three things. The opinion should be informed by um, evidence and we should see that evidence. The reporter should be accountable by showing who they are and also giving us an idea of maybe a history or where they come from. Sometimes in the in, uh, in different newspapers, we'll see a, a, a line that tells us who the person is that's giving us that opinion, what their background is. Just like if I was to write an op-ed, I would want them to say, Michael Spikes is a, you know, a, a researcher of news literacy and so on. And we will wanna see some relative independence where again, the outlet itself would not be seen to have a particular point of view or try to input, use that point of view to direct that opinion. So here are some of our takeaways. Information can be separated into neighborhoods based on key characteristics. Now, other forms of media can may borrow characteristics of news and this can create a blurring of lines between each of these categories or genres as I referred to them earlier. News can be characterized with the acronym VINA that's verification, independence and accountability. Now, how could we think about using this in libraries? Now, with, now, these come from some of the ideas that have been submitted by in some of the projects that I've worked on with librarians before. Some of these uh, include starting with just creating an awareness of each of these genres or the blurred lines that can occur between each genre. So highlight the differences between them and the differences between platforms that are mediated, such as news outlets, where there are people in the middle of uh, between the creator and the consumer and those that are disintermediated. We can also promote mindful media creation and sharing by and sometimes demonstrating the ease by which media can be created and shared online and highlight how this lack of friction does lead more people to use it, but can also lead to less mindful message sharing. And we may also engage patrons with these ideas that I just talked about, verification, independence, accountability. We can use those as a starting point to understand the media that we're seeing, what may have been the intention of the people who have created it, and what are they hoping to do in sharing this information. Then ask patrons, how might they find these attributes on their own? Um, and how might they think about them? So, I wanted to make sure to give us a couple minutes toward the end here for questions. So that would do it for me. I want to thank you again for being here today. Um, there, if you have questions or, or want to find out more about some of the concepts used or some of the things that I talked about, you can contact me there. My email address is there. And also, I want to say that this was derived from a lesson from the Center for News Literacy. So their uh, website is there to learn more about them and you can get resources on for free. You, you, uh, they may ask you to register, but it's still free. And you can get those, those resources at digitalresource.center. So thank you very much. I'm gonna jump over to the Q&A and see if there are some questions that have come up here or if Beth or Linda have any questions for me. Thanks, Michael, this is Beth. I put, um, it looks like Mary um, asked a question and I put it in the chat there. Definitely. So, um, so the question I do see is, um, have we done any work with students in helping them talk to their parents about news or media literacy? The adults also need the education. So, um, so one of the, you know, I started the development of a project with uh, an organization here in the Chicago area in which we wanted to look at that. We wanted to look at learning between um, young people and their, um, their parents. Now I have to admit, we haven't, that, that project was still in the making over time and sort of have not gone too far. But I know of a colleague of mine as well, her name is, um, Da, 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 da. Stephanie Edgerly, uh, she's at Medill. She's done some work on this in terms of civic uh, knowledge. If, if we increase 
the level of civic knowledge for young people that then that knowledge comes into the home and it helps their parents to think differently about this kind of work. So, um, so I would definitely say there is a lot of potential to do so. I, in particular, while I've been doing work in schools and whatnot, I have not in particular worked on a project in which we wanted to look at what were the outcomes for adults if we gave kids these kinds of skills. But I'm gonna I'm right with you in saying that it's just as important for adults to learn these skills as young people to do so. And then I, there was one question here, where does punditry fall? When we were talking about, um, oh, did the different parts of, um, I think it was, um, talking about the the video of um, now I forget his name. Oh, uh, Cohen, uh, right. Tyler Cohen. Yeah. So um, one of the things I think we probably find ourselves, what we find in front of ourselves, lots of times is we have a lot of uh, programming that is in a news like uh, ecosystem or news e, but we hear a lot of opinions in it. So. Yeah, I'm just gonna call out CNN and you know the cable news stations for that. Where now, granted, you keep into account they gotta feel like 24 hours of programming and just having people, you know, talk is cheap. So it's cheap for news outlets to instead of sending reporters out to do reporting, it's cheaper for them to bring pundits in and just talk about what's happening. And a lot of times, and sometimes what that is, you know, some of it is yes, it's cheaper, and then some of it is we just gotta fill time. So what I would always emphasize there in terms of punditry is say, again, use that BIA structure. Ask yourself, if you're hearing a pundit talk um, on, on air, ask what kind of things that are they using to verify the claims that they're making? Are they using evidence to do so? And is their intent, does it seem that their intent is to inform instead of just to persuade? Because yeah, it can, you know, what we what we want from punditry, and I would say good punditry, what it helps us to do is make sense out of all the news that we see around us. And there are some outlets I think do that better than others, but we want to look for and have that sense of I want to be informed, I want to peel back layers of what's happening instead of just saying, oh, I'm getting mad about this and I'm getting even more mad about it because of what that person is saying. So be aware of those things. And I think we just have time for maybe one, just one more question here. And it looks like it's from Donna. So, uh, so yeah, I see advice regarding the apparent change in regard happening to new sources that have been highly regarded in the past, that have become accountable to their owners rather than their audience and are no longer a viable news source. Um, hmm. Ah, okay, okay, so I see. So I think some of this comes up in when we talk about independence of outlets. So in particular, what I would emphasize is, so one of the things that we wrangle with, especially when we talk about media literacy education, is that there can be extremes. Some extremes and what we don't want to do for young people or for anyone learning these skills is turn them into cynics who believe, who don't believe anything who say, well, I can't trust this person. I can't trust that person because X, Y, and Z has happened. And we see that in news outlets, New York, you know, the big ones, CNN, New York Times, all those people, there are people there and they'll make mistakes at times. So I cannot say that I've read this story just yet on a CNN director or being in this undercover video. Um, but, you know, I'm sure that there are people who work at news outlets that probably do have particular points of view and want to try to use the news programming to do so. But what we would hope is that the outlets have other people and have practices in place that will allow folks to say, okay, I understand that's your point of view and this is maybe what you want to do, but our goal is to inform. And as a consumer, if you start to watch say content on a news outlet and it does start to become something that seems very much more like its intent is to um, uh, persuade rather to inform, that may say to you as a consumer, okay, I gotta, I would come here for the persuasion or I come here for the opinion or maybe sometimes to have my own political persuasions to be, um, uh, what's the word I would, I would use? Um, to find people to conform with or so I can't think of the right word right now, but you know that's the intent of that. 
then we may say we go to other outlets to make sure that I am informed um, instead of just being persuaded. So, you know, think about those things. Again, I, this is why I always kind of start off with the VIA. It gives us uh, opportunities to just have some tools to use to make those decisions on our own and to be aware mistakes can happen, but are the outlets accountable for those mistakes? So if CNN comes out, you know, in relation, I'm just, again, I'm just working off of the, the headline. If CNN was to come out and say, we know we had this producer, we have let them go, or we have worked with them and on other kinds of programs or whatnot, and they say to you how, um, how they tried to make changes to make sure that that does not become the perception of their programming. All right, thank you so much, Michael. And thank you everyone for uh, your interest and your attention. Um, I'll be following up within the next few days with a link to the recording. And uh, everyone just have a great afternoon. And again, thank you so much, Michael. Thanks again. You all have a good one. Thanks, Michael.